So let me introduce my family. This is Will. Hi, Will. How are you? Hi. I like Lindy. Hello. Hello. My daughter Katie. Hi, Katie. Nice to see you. My parents, Mr. and Mrs. Carter. Hello, Dad. Introduce her. Hello. Nice to see you. See you, sir. Well, I think maybe we should all gather here for a little something that's going to happen right now. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. No. Right. Okay. So we're going to move in front of the fireplace. Oh. Right over here. Here. This is to certify that the Secretary of Defense has awarded the Defense Superior Service Medal to Major Thomas L. Carter, United States Air Force, for exceptionally meritorious service for the Armed Forces of the United States, with the citation to read as follows. Major Thomas L. Carter, United States Air Force, distinguished himself by exceptionally superior service as the Air Force aide to the President of the United States from July 1984 to August 1986. Major Carter has displayed superior leadership, exemplary foresight, and tireless effort, which were of paramount importance to the President and the nation. In this highly visible position, he routinely planned and coordinated numerous events of national and international significance. His role as the emergency actions officer for the pres president's travel was accomplished with expertise and professionalism. Major Carter served as a White House agent responsible for supervising the use of Department of Defense resources, supporting the commander in chief's travel throughout the world. His performance as the military coordinator for the presidential trips to Canada and Spain in 1985 were particularly noteworthy and contributed immeasurably to the office of the president and to the effectiveness of the, United, of the White House military organization. The distinctive accomplishments of Major Carter reflect great credit upon himself, the United States Air Force, and the Department of Defense. That's OK, sir. <laughs> I always want a word in that citation about becoming a cattleman, too. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you. Well, congratulations and thank you. And good luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, yeah, got a family shot yes. a little quick if you want to. No, I think we should. Come on, Katie. Just come right down here. Souvenir. Oh. And you may be reading a book and have to put it down in your book. Right? And uh, you also. Thank you, sir. And maybe you could use a key ring like a seal. Thank you. And there are two other people here that can share a jar engraved with a seal and containing jelly beans. <laughs> My. Oh. And in case you're tempted to try and open it before you get home with someone you might not like, here's a sample for each of you of what's in there. Thank you. Mr. President? You're wise. Major Carter has uh, assumed a position as uh, Secretary Bill's senior defense advisor. I, that's what I understand. No, we didn't know that. Well, we're going to do our best to facilitate your defense agenda up there as much as we can. All right. So, Senator is solidly behind him all the way. Good enough. Well, well again, thank you for everything. Yes, sir. It's been a pleasure Listen. to serve. I know Tom's in well, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Citation. Oh, thank you. Okay. Can you say thank you? Thank you. Yes, sir. It was a pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Thanks again, sir. Okay, good luck. Call us nice down there anytime. Bye. Right. We'll Thanks, Jim. Goodbye. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Come on. 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 Come on.
President? Delighted, sir. Yeah, it's good to see you. Thank you. I'm very glad to meet you. Well, listen, I'm glad to meet you, and God bless you, and thank you for all that you have done for our country. Thank you, sir. I'll do it again anytime. Especially in you. I know you're busy. I thank you for this time. Well, listen, you're just a little souvenir. All right. So you won't forget it. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless. You know, our best to Nancy. Thank you, sir. You know, Mr. President, I think that Dave is the only person in the country that talked to more young people last year than you did. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. I was having to speaking to about a quarter of a million kids a year in public schools. Hey, that's great, yes, sir. And uh, I walk in, I dress them, I usually say, hi, I'm Dave Reaver. I have pimples, you have scars. Where are you? <laughs> they don't know the difference. <laughs> Good day, sir. Thanks again. Right. I'm so honored to meet you. Thank you so much. And thanks for this lovely gift. Good day. Great honor to see you again. Good to see you again. Yeah. And thank you very much, not only for that book, but for that very generous inscription. Well, you deserve a word and a lot more. I certainly appreciate all you're doing to save the country from the infidels. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm working on a new book regarding primarily your defense and foreign policy and uh, trying, we hope, to build uh, public support, particularly for the SDI. So uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions primarily on that. Um, tell me, first of all, how did you happen to decide upon the SDI? Who gave you the first idea? Now, the funny thing was, it was the other way around. Oh, I've been having some meetings, uh, a number of meetings on this situation, and I had never been comfortable with the idea that the only defense that we could have in this very dangerous world was uh, the threat of blowing the other fellow up if he tried to blow us up first. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one day, a meeting in the cabinet room with uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I have always uh, been of the mind that there has never been an offensive weapon invented that someone didn't come along with the defense against, but the defense against it, except with nuclear weapons. And then the only thing we could think of was this threat of the Mutual Assured Destruction Program. So I asked him, citing this fact of every weapon having produced a defense against itself, I asked him if they believed there, that there could be a defensive system developed that could really make these weapons obsolete. And uh, almost unanimous, well, it was unanimous. They said yes, they felt that could be done. So you told them to go right to work with it? I said yes, let's start and see if we can't find this. And uh, that's how it came into being. And of course, it was an opponent of the idea that launched the title of Star Wars, and I thought that this was supposed to deprecate the whole idea. But um, it's now, uh, the research is going on, there have been several breakthroughs, and there's great optimism among the people working on it, that such a system can be developed. I know you have said several times that you will not trade away the FDI research or any kind of concession on missiles. No, as a matter of fact, I think that the great purpose of FDI can be uh, to make itself in reality unneeded. In other words, that if this does come through and we have, the research reveals that we have such a, a system that can d destroy the, the incoming missiles, that this can make those nuclear missiles obsolete and can then be the greatest help in getting agreements to eliminate nuclear weapons worldwide. Now, do you think that before your term is out that you could actually deploy a small part of this as has been advocated as a point of defense perhaps? No, I don't, I don't think so. But what I think we can do is work toward an agreement, a treaty that could supersede some of the existing treaties to the effect that if and when research develops that there is, and it is practical to have such a system, then to explore the idea 
rather than to try and deploy it while you still had offensive weapons, which would seem to the world that we were then trying to develop a first strike capability, that we would instead say to the world, now, let's all share in this on the basis of all of us doing away with our offensive weapons. Have you made that, in effect, an offer to Gorbachev? I've talked about that with him uh, in Geneva. And, uh, you know, there's, there's always mistrust, and uh, he wasn't prepared to believe that I really meant that. Well, he, uh, of course, is giving the same line that all we wanted for is a shield behind which to launch the first strike. Yes, that's what he was thinking. That's why uh, I'm looking forward to future meetings, and which maybe we can uh, indicate to him that that isn't what we want. And you've told him that time and again, but yes. then you have to really prove it to him, I guess. Well, you know, some of your best friends in the Senate Armed Services Committee, including Senator Pete Wilson from California, are advocating that you do deploy at least part of this as a first stage, perhaps to defend uh, perhaps the, uh, our own uh, missile sites. Is that still a possibility? Uh, I don't know. I think, I think we have to be very careful and watch. Re remember that that deployment isn't going to be like suddenly being handed a new gun and now you've got it and you can pull the trigger. And you wonder what would be the threat that would be generated if, with all of us still having the nuclear weapons, uh, you started to deploy knowing that it was going to take uh, a considerable period of time to get this in place. And would someone then be tempted to say, well, we better get them while we can before that is in place? And there's a danger it might uh, stimulate a strike. Yes. Otherwise, yeah. boy. Mm -hmm. And I well, think this is something to seriously think about. Mm -hmm. You uh, certainly are going ahead not only with research, but actual testing, aren't you? We think that that has to be done, but I would think then that uh, uh, that we should invite, invite the world to see it. And the Soviets in particular to see it. Yes. And you think, uh, according to your interpretation, that this would be permitted under the ABM treaty, wouldn't it, the testing? Uh, I don't know whether final or uh, and any extensive testing is uh, uh, is permitted under that treaty, but I do think that we're safe in going forward. Uh, we're within the treaty and going forward with the research and uh, then the knowledge that we either have or do not have such a system. And you were really, I know in the meeting today with several members of Congress, urged them to restore some of the cuts that are apparently going to be made in SDI and other defense items. I, I hope they will restore those, uh, well, put back in, you mean the money. Uh, yes, and the defense authorization. Yes, yes, because actually the things that uh, they wanted to do with that typical attitude among so many up there that the only source of money when needed is take it away from defense, actually what they would do if they had their way with the reductions is really set back the research that we're doing now at a very sensitive moment and add considerably to the period of time it would take to. Well, that's the problem. If you stretch it out, then you do delay it. So uh, yeah. you want a minimum, I guess, three billion at least a uh, year. Yes. Four if you can get it. Yep. Uh, are you encouraged by the uh, the search uh, advances made in the lasers, for example? And some of I I think there have been a number of breakthroughs that, as I say, have made the people who are working in this very optimistic and. I'm sharing that optimism now on the basis of what we know. But you do still have a lot of opposition. I know apparently in Congress from people who were afraid that this would break up the whole arms control. Uh, yes, and I wonder how they reason and what they, what they think. A uh, number of those same people, if you look back over their attitude to, up until this time in this particular incident, are those that believe that appeasement is the, the way to go. Well, uh, they tried that, and we wound up not the whole rhythm of the monopoly on nuclear weapons, but uh, far back in second place. No, that's true. Uh, when we relied on them uh, just to be nice and uh, build up a certain point, they went on beyond. Didn't they? Well, you certainly have tried with the Soviet leaders to make them understand you don't 
aim to build it beyond for a first strike. Uh, you're confident of another summit? Maybe you can uh, explain those ideas a little better. I think we can. I think that we, we're talking to a man now. You have to, no one's noticed very much. This is the first Russian leader in all these years that going all the way back to 1946 in attempts to get uh, arms control agreements and so forth. This is the first one that has ever volunteered to reduce the number of weapons they already have. And you're going to hold it and do that offer, aren't you? Yep. Uh, so. Because, you know, up until now, you take all these treaties, they are all based on limiting how fast you increase. Well, I said several years ago when I announced my opposition to a couple of the treaties, I said, isn't it time to sit down and start talking about a treaty that reduces the number of weapons? And this is the way I think to go, and this is the first man that has made that same kind of a suggestion himself. Excuse me, Mr. President, we do have some more people out there oh, that need to come I think we just love to stay here and talk all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Always a pleasure to see you, sir. Good to see you. Indeed. Well, you gave me so much help in writing the other book. Yeah, I, think I'll I'll some some thank you for it. Thank you. I hope you have time to read back some of the things you said then. <laughs> right. It's a great pleasure to see you. And honestly, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm.